Ooh, what's going on, everybody? How's it going? We're back again. It's another Ono Lives Coffee and Cigars. This is number 49. Can you believe that? 49 episodes of Coffee and Cigars, and we're back again. It's Thursday, July 1st. Wow, July 1st already. The summer is rolling by. And it's blazing here in Baltimore. Today and this week has been just super, super hot. Like 90s and 100 degrees uh, heat index with very little wind. It's just been a brutal, brutal week. And this is the kind of weather that Baltimore is known for. Like last week we had really cool weather, really enjoyable, like even like cold weather. Like it was down like in the upper 60s. And, but this week it came back with a vengeance just to show you that. So it's like one of those things where like last week the weather was nice enough that you're thinking, oh, if summer was like this here in Baltimore, this could be the best place in America. But no, 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 no. We have to have the oppressive heat and humidity that we normally have. And actually today we started off, so the last couple of days has been like 90s, 90 plus into the 100 with the heat index. Then this morning when I came out, woke up and came outside, it was 77, and which is kind of a nice, it's a nice, you think, you look at the phone, you look at the weather, it says 77. And you think, okay, that's gonna be all right. But the problem is, is that it's not all right because the humidity is really that high. So, yeah, it's been a high humidity day, but relatively cool, and plus a lot of rain. The, today it's been raining off and on all day long. It's about to rain again. And you know, you'd think that the rain helps, but it doesn't help. It, it's still, like it was a little bit cooler earlier, then it rained, and then it got, then it stopped, got sunny, then rained again, then stopped, then rained again. And like, it was relatively cooler, but after that last rain, it just cr increasingly got warmer. Like, it, it's just not, not friendly here. So, we are, Uh-oh, what am I doing here? I need to look at, there's one thing I need to, to review here before we can continue on the stream. So welcome back, thanks for watching. Really appreciate you being here. We are, I'm just trying to check on one thing to, just to see about if I have the, the correct settings on the, on the, the stream. All right, so like I said, we're back again. It's July 1st, it's blazingly hot, and it's not quite nice tonight. And so what I did here in the studio is I actually turned the AC on and I just tried to get it as cold as possible before the show started, and then I turned on the exhaust system. And the exhaust system I have here pulls pretty hard, right? It, it's, it really does do a lot of suction. However, the problem is that it sucks everything out. So where I was feeling cool earlier now, the suction is happening, it's, and what happens is it, it pulls air from outside the building, right? And it actually pulls it from one of the other rooms that, that isn't air conditioned. So uh, the, the air that's coming in now is warm and it's all getting kind of hot, so there. Anyway, so today we're, got, we're gonna be bringing our coffees. So we've got a coffee this week from Mexico that a friend of mine, Sylvia, down there sent to me a while back. And it's called the Finca Cerro Brujo from Chiapas. And it's their, from their Barista Champ um, brand. And it's a, it's a nice, well, I haven't tried it actually. I, I can't say it's nice because I have no idea. But it's made by um, the Etrusca people in uh, Mexico City. And this one is a uh, Garnica variety with a wash processed and um, Tueste is, not, oh, Tueste. But anyway, so it, it, it's, it's a nice, so if you want to see, this is the Finca Cero Bruja from Ocozocoautla in Chiapas, Mexico. And so it's a lighter roasted coffee. They, let's see here. 
Yeah, so it's a little bit, it's a, it's a lighter roasted coffee. We'll hold it up here so you can kind of, so you can see it's on the lighter side, right? And we're going to do that in this thing called the Kalita Cafe Tall. I like that. And this is a, a Kalita is a Japanese um, maker of brewing devices. And this is their Cafe Tall. It's supposed to be their travel coffee brewer. And it's, it's just really small, really small. It has this little wedge shape with three holes. And the, the nice thing I, I like about these Kalitas, or at least this style of brewer, is that it has these holes that help to retard the water flow, you know. And you guys may be familiar with these V60s that have this, you know, Venturi-style ribbing on the, on the sides of it, like much like this, except it's a Venturi shape. So you can see the ribbing here. And what that does, it keeps the, the filter from sticking to the sidewall of the brewer and preventing the flow of the water, right? And so what's nice about having these three holes is that it retards that it holds back the flow. Because I think that with the V60, because it's such, or, or similar, that have one large orifice, it's very easy to to under-extract and under-brew the coffee. And, and you really have to have a lot of... Um, patience and timing and then if you have staff if you have a barista that you're teaching you have to get a lot of training so that they can control the water flow to give it the proper amount of time for brewing if that makes sense all right so for this we need to have wedge paper filters and for that we have the Kalita 101 these coffee filters these are all from Japan like so my friend Raymond gave me this one day and he was very kind enough to give me this, and he gave me some filters. And these are available, like, on Amazon. Uh, I got these when I was in Tokyo during, uh, during a trip out there. There we are. We have the opening here. We've got our filters, right? And then we have... Oh, where's the paper? So there it is. It's a, rel it's a pretty small... So it's nice, and, you know, you've got... This, so if, if you want to make coffee on, on the road while you're traveling, it's like, it's just this very compact and the nice thing about this is that it'll it's all plastic and it'll take quite a beating you know like it'll crush a little bit right it, it won't crush all the way like if your if your bags totally get smashed well this will break but it'll take abuse from the run and it's compact and you don't need to have the box you can just grab the filters put them like in your shoe in your bag shove this in the other shoe and it's totally out of the way right so it's kind of nice in that respect. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get our little stand here. We've got our Yama Brewer, Brew Lake mug. Oh, I've got to change it. Okay. This goes on top. So this will fit on your mug. So if you want to put this on a, on a cup as well, this will fit on a cup. So if you wanted to have it on a cup, well, this is a little bit big, but let's say my... Let's say we use this, right? We use this. It'll kind of fit there. Yeah, it fits. And the nice thing is that, as you can see here, this hole, right? You can actually, if you're brewing from above, you can also use the hole as a sight to see into the cup and make sure that the flow is happening as you wish. Yes? Okay. So, but we're going to go back to the glass. Put that on top. We're going to take our filter and we're going to fold over right at the edges, right at where the, right where the seams are, right? We're folding that over. This way, the filter sits flush inside the brewer, as thus, well, so much for being totally flat, but close enough. And then we're going to add our coffee. This is a medium kind of grind. I'm just going to level it out right all right there we are ready to go we're getting our water just off the boil and actually you you see me use this in previous shows with this 
gooseneck kettle. Let me stand up here and brew. The only down, the, the one downside about this Kalita Tall is that it is a small brew chamber, so you really can't put very much coffee in at any one time. So you kind of have to go slow, allow for a little bit of a bloom, and then continue on. But like I was saying with this gooseneck kettle, right, this is actually also made by Kalita. Oops. Yeah. But the, the, the nozzle here was designed by Ichiro Sakiguchi from Cafe de Lombre. And I believe he, this, he went to Kalita to have them make these, because these... This particular kettle is kind of like the small version of the one they use at Lombre. So again, my friend Raymond, he had these. Thank you, Raymond. And Raymond has his own uh, coffee shop and coffee machine business in Manila. So we always get together and hang out, usually, usually in Manila, but sometimes wherever in the world we may be. So how are you guys all doing tonight? Where are you guys uh, smoking? What are you smoking? Where are you smoking? Are you indoors, outdoors? Like, are you one of those crazies that are outdoors because it's super, it's kind of hot outside, right? And uh, what are you drinking? Like I said, this is the Finca Cera Brujo from Chiapas. It's a uh, coffee from Mexico. And it's a relatively light roast. Looks kind of like, you know, just past first crack. It's kind of a festive color, these yellow and red. Huh? All right, that should be good. And Dai says he's working, working. Good Lord, man. That's, at least you have air conditioning. That's good, that's good. All right, so it's, uh, the brew is done. I'm just going to take that and put that over here. Put that to the side. All right, let's see how that turns out. All right, let's give it a try. So, let's see. Let's see what they say first. It's a. Uh, it's kind of got this light floral aroma. Hmm. Light, kind of thin. A little bit florally. A little bit more on the brighter side. Very low body. Kind of like a honeysuckle character on the on the tongue. Let's see, what do they say we're supposed to taste? So it says here on the bag. Uh, what does it say? Floral. Frutus amarillo, so yellow fruit. Blueberry y madera de cedro. Madera de cedro con un de cel, de cel, I can I can barely read because my eyesight is going. So this little teeny tiny handwriting is oh maybe I can read it there. De sello de avellana tostada. Ah nuts, toasted nuts con un de celo. De sello? I don't know what de sello. Uh, that's a word I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, maybe some nuts. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. It's a little bit on the light side. Maybe I would have, maybe on the next one I'll grind it finer. It's kind of a medium grind, but maybe a finer grind would be the way to go. All right, so how's everyone doing? This is episode 49 for the live stream. So we're getting close to 50. I was going to do something nice for 50, but then I thought, you know what? 
150 is an important number. Really, I guess the milestone is the one year mark, which is uh, going to be on the 29th. So I'm looking for a nice cigar for the 29th for us to try. And oh man, it's starting to get warm in here. <laughs> oh, this Baltimore weather is just so oppressive. How's the weather for you guys, wherever you guys are? All right, so here we are, Tobacco Leaf. Today's cigar is from the minds of the folks at Hoya de Nicaragua in Esteli, Nicaragua. And we have the Hoya Silver, Toro. All right, here's the thing, right? So you, if you remember last week, we had the Superfly by Oscar Valladares and their Toro. Now their Toro was this hunking, like 56 ring gauge. It's, it was thick, like this, this by comparison feels puny. Like you're just like, oh, these, when you hold the two Toros together, like I wish I could show you the other one because I only, I, I smoked the other one, but when you hold them together, you're like, oh, this is Toro and this is Toro? Superfly? I mean, the Superfly is like Toro. This is like Toro. But, you know, we'll find out. So this is 6x52. I think the other one's 6x56. So, I mean, it's a four ring gauge difference. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, it's, I guess, on the small side of Toro. I think most Toros that I tend to gravitate towards are on the 54 instead of 56. Like, 56 is, that's pretty substantial, right? I don't know. What do you think? Drop in the comments below. What do you think a Toro should be? 54, 56, 52? So six, six, right? Toros are six inches. Yeah, Toro. So here we are. This is the, the Hoya Silver. It's got a nice looking wrapper, right? Look at that. That's nice. Not too silky, a little bit dry feeling, but not, not dry in the way that it's like crispy, cracky and going to fall off and flake off. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't feel oily. It feels kind of dry on the thing. Oh, Gus, my gosh, good to see you, my friend. The raining in South Florida. Yeah, it's about, it's, it's starting to rain here. It's, it's, it's been raining off and on here in Baltimore and probably just as hot and humid as it is in, in Florida for you. So are you close to what's been going on in uh, Surfside with the, the condo? Man, that place was crazy. I can't believe it. It made me think about the condo my family used to have in Ocean City, Maryland, where, you know, that's a 20, it was a 21, 22-story building. I mean, God, if it collapsed, I mean, my parents' condo was on the first floor, so that would have been, like, it's terrible. Anyway, anyway, so how are the boys doing there, Gus, you know? I see that, uh, I see that the, the jefe is out in, uh, in London this week. Okay, so let's see. So we're getting light, I would say light barnyard, light manure. Again, that pleasant, oh. Maybe like a, a dry cacao. Almost like a dark powdered cacao. Oh. Broward County. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> you know, for all, all the other guys that are watching, you know, Gus, I've known Gus for many, many years since we lived in Honolulu, and he was the first guy to pierce Britney Spears. Did, by the way, speaking of which, did you see that article? They, had, they were talking about her last week, Britney, and talking about how whatever she did in her past, they, like, I guess they got mad at the father, like, you know, wrestle control of her, of her, of everything from her. Basically, she's like living indentured servitude to her dad. I was like, man, I couldn't believe that. I, I mean, you, like, you know, I remember the time when she was kind of all like getting kind of wild, but man, to have all of your like, what do they call the conservatorship? I mean, that seems, that seems straight out of Handmaid's Tale. All right, so it's pleasant. It's got pleasant light spiciness to it. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so let's move on to the cutting. And our, our official cutting is with the Zykar MTX. 
non-sponsored. All right, we're cutting that off there, nice. There's the cut, not too bad. I do think that the, the Zykar cutter is getting a little bit on the on the duller side. It's 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 on the other side of its sharpest point. All right, let's see. Core draw sweet. Sweet and very pleasant. Maybe a little bit of cacao on the like a, like a light light cacao. All right, let's light. We're gonna use some matches today. Tobacco leaf black matches. Or black by Rahul. Oh God, these things break. Terrible. Come on, come on, what are you doing? Where are you going? Good Lord. There's a little fan to my right. Now, I don't know if this is because the way I lit it, but as I was lighting, there's a bit of like bright acridity on my tongue. You know, not a very pleasant one. All right, let's see. So the first few puffs in the light was not pleasant. It's a, there's definitely a strong brightness to the smoke that is um, interesting. Let me just move some of these things out of the way. So what's going on with you guys? How have you been? What have you been up to? Anything happening interesting this week? The, the draw is a bit on the tighter side. So, so far the, the flavor, uh, the initial flavor now is rather bright. A little bit sharp, the, the draw is a bit tight, starting to burn a little bit unevenly, right? I don't think I was too off in the way that I lit it. Right here, my fingers are right there. Right here, there feels to be some warmth here underneath the, the wrapper. Like it's not, it doesn't feel, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel like it's burning evenly. It feels like, like it's loose. It's pretty loose right here. It feels pretty soft and warm right there. Like right there, it's warm, right there. Like my fingers are pretty hot right there. So we're smoking the Hoya Silver Toro which is um, a cigar that they released in 19 and 2018 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Hoya de Nicaragua. And it's, um, it's made with Nicaraguan fillers and a Mexican binder, which are unspecified, and then an Oscuro wrapper from Ecuador. So the wrapper looks really pretty, right? The wrapper was, is pretty, but... 
the initial light is a bit troubled. It feels a bit troubled. Like I, it's it's got a very sh bright, uh, acidic character to it. That's that's really the the dominant experience with the cigar so far is that it's bright, really bright, acidic. And not so much else at the moment. So it was originally was released in August of 2018. And um, it's made by the Hoya de Nicaragua factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Hmm. I'm not. Let's see what these other guys have to say, what their experience is like, because so far the experience is just this kind of bright, acidic smoke that doesn't really have. I'm not getting much depth beyond that. You know, I, I think that this coffee. This Cerro Brujo, this light bodied bright honeysuckle-ish coffee actually goes kind of nicely with the bright acidic acidity of the, of the of the cigar but it's just a it's just a bright acidic cigar that that if it, at this current time it just doesn't have a lot of dynamism it doesn't have a lot of depth or complexity at the moment The, the draw seems to be getting a little bit easier at the moment. But I think I'm starting to go a little bit too fast on it. So let's see. Let's see what the other guys are, have found with this cigar. We're going to see what... Uh, what's his name? Who, who did this one? We're going to look at what Brooks Whittington from Half Wheel had to say about his experience. So he, he Brooks did this particular, he did, they did one in uh, 2018 when it was first released, and then they did a redux in July of 2020. I don't know why they decided to go again, but let's have a look. All right, so here it is. He says that it features a number of flavors right off the bat. Two notes stand out dark chocolate, creamy almonds. And then he also has creamy oak, cinnamon, leather, freshly brewed espresso, and a slight floral flavor. Um, more spice than he was expecting, nice white pepper, and then graham cracker sweetness. You know, maybe there was some graham cracker sweetness when I started out, or started with the cold draw, but so far, dark chocolate, creamy almonds, then creamy oak, cinnamon, leather, freshly brewed espresso. No, and I don't really, I'm not really getting any of that today. Right now it's, it's the, the sharpness of the acidity has mellowed slightly. So hopefully it's going to transition and, and start showing some of these flavors that Brooks identified in his review. Now he also did one in 2018 when the when the line was first released. And let's see what he says here. So here he says um, creamy cashew and oak combination dominant, followed by leather, dark chocolate, hay, and bread. Maybe some of this. Maybe I'm getting some of the hay. Maybe some bread. Maybe a little white pepper, but really, all these things they talk about, I'm just not getting in this particular example. Now let's see what, what Will says at Cigar Coop. And Will did this, when did he do this one? This is from 2019. Let's see here. Tasting notes. Earth, cedar, natural tobacco, black cherry, mixed pepper. Black cherry. I mean, 
the acidity is such that maybe like a sour cherry could be, I would, you know, could concur with that. Maybe like a brighter cedar could be, white pepper could be. The, the sharpness of the acidity is starting to mellow. And then who else is out there? Let's see, Cigar Dojo. Let's see what Cigar Dojo, they did theirs in uh, uh, December 2018. So right after this cigar first came out. So we're talking like now, what, four, nearly four years ago, three years ago at least. Which is an interesting thing. Like if, you know, this is one of those things where the line was released in 2018. Are they able to maintain a consistent flavor profile, which over what is obviously multiple releases of the cigar. All right, let's see here. The guys from Cigar Dojo. They talk about savory, lemon zest. Yeah, yeah, lemon zest. I can see that. The sweet, creamy caramel, all the subtle bounce of spice, earth, savory notes. Maybe I could say savory, sure. Cinnamon, citrus, yeah, from the lemon zest. I can see there's some, that brightness could def definitely be partly of the cinnamon character. So it is a box press cigar. And as you can see in this, it talks about in the box press cigar, there's cool temperature and smoke. I don't find that this is cooler necessarily. I've, it, like I said, it's our, earlier it started off pretty hot. You can even feel the heat in certain spots. And you guys know that I, I do like I do enjoy the aroma of revenge quite a lot, and that is a box press robusto. And then the other one that I really enjoy is the SP fifty four from from Abe Flores, another box press. And so those have very smooth draws. And this one doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not to the equal in that. This draw is definitely more restricted. Like for example, it's the if you if you if, if you have the revenge and the box press revenge, which is kind of like a box press robusto, it has a very smooth draw. Comparatively, the breach of the peace, which is a, which is the robusto of the intemperance line, has a tighter draw compared to the revenge. This is closer in in the tightness of draw to the breach of the breach of the peace than the other than the revenge. I can't say that they're, that's either, that's bad necessarily. Just it just requires more work, and the the smoke so far we're we're now towards the end of the first third, right? And it's still pretty pretty citrus, pretty bright, pretty acidic. It hasn't really developed the characters that that were noted in in Cigar Coop and, and uh, Half Wheels reviews hmm I don't know so what's been what do you guys been up to I've been watching the um, the Loki series I've been watching that and that's been kind of interesting they introduced a new character last week and I think the new episode just came out yesterday, so I'm interested to see what the fourth episode is going to be like. And I'm not sure exactly how long they're going to run this this series. Hopefully, it's not six episodes. I thought I thought the Falcon and the Winter Soldier at six episodes was a little bit too short. I would like to see ten. Ten would be nice. Or I think what was it? Uh, one division was eight, at least eight. You know, give us some more substance. But I guess you know Marvel's hitting us pretty hard this past this year because 
There has been one division. There has been Falcon the Winter Soldier, and now we have Loki. And then next this month, we're in July now. So this month we're having the Black Widow. So yeah, I mean, I guess you know they're hitting us pretty hard with with uh, Marvel stuff. So that's that's pretty good. That's a good thing. What I've really been watching heavily lately is um, The Handmaid's Tale. I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but like, I was on a flight maybe two years ago on United, and they were showing an episode. Well, they had, you know, some episodes of Handmaid's Tale, and I, I think, I'm pretty sure I watched one of them. And uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting. And I always I was thought that, oh, I need to watch that. I need to watch that. Oh, and Dai says he just got a flash flood warning again. Are you in a place where the flash flood can happen? Like, if you are, you should be careful. I did not get one on my phone. Otherwise, it would be ringing in my ears. It does tell me, though, that rain starts, like, in 10 minutes. Then also, a lot of times, it'll tell me when, it's gonna, when it expects to stop. But that's no joke. Like, earlier today, man, there was a heavy downpour in Hamden. And you know, I don't really think too much about rain in Hamden, at least where the shop is on the avenue. Because it's actually at the, the avenue's at the, at the top of a, essentially a big hill. So everything from the avenue runs down. Now, if you're like some of these other shops that are like at the mill centers, okay, that's a problem because that will over, overrun the Jones Falls. And, you know, cause all kinds of havoc. So that could be very problematic. But in Hamden, on the avenue in Hamden, I never worry about it. Essentially because, like, if there was going to be really, if there was really flooding going to happen, it would be biblical proportion. Like, we're talking Noah's Ark kind of, like, destruction, right? Because it's, the, it's essentially the highest point in Baltimore. So it's still... It's rolling along, like it's consistent, it's, it's burning consistently, it's drawing consistently, everything about it is very consistent, it's just consistently bright, low body, acidic, I guess you could describe it like, uh, like they did in, Do in Cigar Dojo, where, where it's kind of like lemon zesty, but to be honest with you, like lemon zesty, citric, acidic kind of smoke is not really to my taste. But, I mean, it's burning very consistent. So, construction-wise, it's really great. Even the wrapper is still quite nice, right? It still feels nice and, and smooth. Still that little slight dryness to it, but not the, not the falling apart dryness. Just a, a slight dryness. I'm going to pull this band off. Just so we can see more about it. The dice asking, have you seen the Mythic Quest? Mythic Quest? Huh. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, a TV series. Hmm. I have not seen this. What does Wikipedia say about it? The series follows a fictional video game show, the studio that produces Mythic Quest, a popular MMORPG. At the start of the series, studio is about to release a major expansion pack to the game. And I, it doesn't say anything about what actually happens. I, I'm guessing that they release the, the game and it takes over the world? And you get pulled into it or something like that? That would be interesting. Mm. Yeah, so let's see. Bright coffee, bright cigar, goes well together.
But I think it's good that uh, that you get that it's good to try different cigars and get different experiences. Like this is this wouldn't necessarily be the kind of flavor profile that I would normally go for, but it's interesting to try. Not just typical. Oh, ah, gotcha. So it's all about like life in the gaming office, like where they develop the, the video games. Kind of like the, I guess, the office for gamers. Which I have to say is a, is a show that I've never seen either, The Office. Like, I've not seen a lot of the shows that people really have loved over the years. Like, for example, Twin Peaks, never saw that. X-Files, never really watched that. Friends, never saw that, really. Seinfeld, never really saw that. What's the guy that, that uh, Larry David show? The one we I can't remember his name, but I never saw that either. So I've missed out on quite a lot of what most people see. Like The Office, I I've never seen that either. Parks and Rec, have not seen that. As much as I, I tend to think that Aubrey, Aubrey Plaza is quite interesting, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen that either. Yeah, so pretty much working in The Office. Oh, okay, maybe I'll check that out, see that with the about. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with everything. But anyway, back to what I was saying, the. The Handmaid's Tale, so there's four seasons, right? The fourth season just came out on Hulu this recently, like within the last couple months. And, but I hadn't seen any of it, so I, I got, I started watching it on Hulu, and then it started with the first season, then the second season, then the third season. And it, it, it's, the premise of this show is that it's set in a dystopian world that, that's essentially the United States where a religious right-wing religious conservative zealots have taken over the country and, and fomented re revolution and civil war, and they have taken over part of the, most of the continental United States and put it under their own um, nation called Gilead, where women are subjugated to um, secondary roles. Like, they can't read, they can't, they can't write, or they're not allowed to. They're, they're forbidden by law. And the, the birth, in, in this world, the birth rate has fallen so much in humanity that they've resorted to taking the fertile women and forcing them into, well, I guess, in, indentured, maybe in, I don't know if it's indentured servitude or outright slavery as handmaids that they assign to um, infertile elite couples that control the country and they're supposed to have babies with the, for them. But it is a dark, dark show. Like, you know, it's, it might not be so bad if you watched it weekly and over, the, and over four seasons, but when you watch it in, a, like in succession, like you power through it, like binge it, man, it's a dark world out there, dark. Like, you know, you get all into it. Like, like right now they're, they're battling in, in Chicago, right? Chicago, I guess, is a, is a part that hasn't been fully taken over by Gilead. So there's a lot of rebellion by Americans, you know, fighting for their nation, for our nation. And, uh, and so it's one of those things where, oh, that's what, in my, in my mind, because I've been binging it all, like, pretty much as much as possible, like, that's what's happening. I'm going, oh. It was like the time that I was reading this book, um, I was reading a Tom Clancy book a long time ago. I was traveling somewhere in the world, and I was reading this book, and it's about, uh, it was about warfare in Europe. It's one of his old books, like from the 90s, and it, was, it's not, it wasn't clear in present danger. But anyway, it was, it was they were, we were having a shooting war against Russia in, in the European theater. And I was so engrossed in this book that I remember my cousin was like, hey, man, what's going on? I said, dude, I don't know what's going on. But in my world, we're at war with Russia and Europe. <laughs> Sometimes I just get so into it that it's like, oh my gosh. Mm, so we should be looking at the mailbag. I did get a box today. Let me pull that out here for you. Actually, this box arrived today, 
And I was wondering, the UPS guy came by, because I, I didn't remember ordering anything. And I was like, he's like, delivery. And I was like, well, what is this? And then I saw the labeling. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I totally forgot that I had ordered this. So I thought I would share it with all of you guys. So this is the Toddy Cupping Brewer, so cupping kit. So, you know, in coffee, we, we cup coffees to test for quality, and it's, it's a hot thing. So basically we brew, and I've done that on the show here with show you the cupping style, but basically you brew the coffee hot, and you taste it hot, right? And then you taste it as it cools. Well, Toddy was, you know, Toddy's a, a company that's focused on cold brew, you know, iced coffee. And so they wanted to develop a better system to cup coffees for cold brew. And they came out with this little system here to do it. And I, I really drew, originally was just going to order one of the cuppers, but they only sold them in sets to, to their wholesale accounts. So I just ordered a, a set. So let's see what's inside here. Here we are. They, they've got their quick start kit. Oh, look at a little quick start kit here. Quick start guide. Then brewing. Oh, that's the same thing. Okay, good, good. So directions on how to do it. And then the some kind of cup. There's three. So in this set, there's three of them, right? So three of these cupping brewers. There's some kind of, what is this? Oh, tongs. Nice, nice for like, and then I'll show you the, here it is. This is the, the cupping brewer. Maybe I'll bring the, the stands back. And Dai says, he's been in pissing contest with UPS, been on the phone. Oh, man, what are you trying to get? What did they miss? One of my, uh, one of my, one of my regulars at the shop, he does, he does a lot of importing of chemicals from, uh, or products, chemical products from Korea, South Korea. And he's been having a heck of a time with, with FedEx because he's, he's been flying them in, right, FedEx. So he's had quite a heck of a time this year. He comes in, you know, a few times a week, and pretty much every time he comes in, it's an update on just how much battling he's done with FedEx that week. Or really that day. All right, so here's the Toddy Brewer. And there's supposed to be more of this. Uh, or did they not send that? Was I supposed to order it separately? Oh, no, there it is. Oh, here it is. Here, here, here. So if you've ever done toddy cold brewing, you know that you take, with a standard home toddy, you take a pound of ground coffee, and you put it in this container and with a gallon of water, and you steep it for 12 or hours or more, and then you... Uh, and then you, 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 you run it through the strainer or whatever in this, in this device. But it takes, the key is that you have to soak the coffee in the water for 12 hours. And this is designed so that you could make small brews of toddy style brewing and then use it as a tasting. And so yes, I was asking, no filter? Yeah, that's, that was my question too. So they do have these tree paper filters they have two types tree pay tree free or oh, tree free and tree killing right tree free tree killing tree free tree killing and so let's have a look we'll open this one tree free 
because we want to be tree free. And come on out of here. Come on. Oh, this is an interesting material. This is a different type of material than that they use on the larger toddy brew bag. So if you if you ever use a toddy commercial brewer, which brews five gallons at a time, they have these bags and the, the material is different. Like this is, like you can see it's kind of fibrous, very fibrous, right? Whereas the, the one for the, the commercial toddies are not like this. They're much more, um, much more like, much more like this material, right? Can you just I guess we're getting overexposed, but more like this, right? So it's more smoothly, smoothly papyrus. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's because this is the non-paper filter. Non-tree. Let's look at the tree. Oh, no, this is the oh, tree-free. This is tree-free. Let's look at the tree-killing filters. Oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is what you're, well, this is one what I'm used to, the tree, the death to trees filter. So as you can see, the, the filtration problem is, is uh, very different, right? Okay, so, we'll just use the, uh, the tree free. Okay, so you basically take the coffee, your ground coffee, and you put it inside the bag, right? And you kind of tighten the bag, and then you put the coffee inside the bag in the toddy thing, add the water, add the lid, put it, they, you could do it at room temperature or put it in your fridge. And you let that steep for, you know, 12 hours or 16 hours or however you want to do it. And they give, in this kit, there's three of them. So you can do these small batch um, brews of toddy and you can, you know, taste it. And, and then after it's all done, you take this out, right? And it's, of course, laden with the weight of the wet coffee. And this, oh, that's what these are for. Okay, so these are strainers specialized strainers that then go on top so you pull the coffee out right you pull the coffee out drop that in and drop the coffee down and then it just sits there and drains and you know drains into the thing and then once that's done you can then take that liquid pour it into your cup and then cup accordingly Huh, kind of nice. I I, decide, I wanted to get this because one of my friends, she was asking me, like, she's teaching a class on it, and she wanted my thoughts on, on how to use it. And I hadn't really used these yet, so I, I thought, well, I'll just order some, and, you know, I'll call up Toddy and have them send me some so I could try it out and familiarize myself with what's going on with it. And, you know, maybe... I'm thinking that I, I was, I was, I just came today, so I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll make it for today, make this for today, but maybe I'll make it for next week. That way we can have it on the, on the show for next week and talk more about that. And so that's it, Toddy. Yes, yeah, small French press will work too. The only, the only downside, the, the big, the big difference between something like this and the French press is the filtration, right? So. And then you can always, you know, the idea is you can always take your French press brew and then look just and pour it through a, a paper filter and that, that will work. However, like the interesting thing with doing that is when you have the ground coffee, right? Like this, can this come out, right? You have this ground coffee, right? So when, when you put all the ground coffee in, in a filter, it all flows through relatively evenly, right? However, when you just take the filter and you pour, like, let's say 
you uh, you press your French press and then you pour the liquid through the paper filter. Oh, the cigar's gone out. The only thing that goes, the only thing that's coming out of the the French press is just the really, really fine, fine particulates. And those little fine particulates will tend to clog the the paper filter. So it, it, it suddenly just almost stops filtering and just takes forever to filter. You know, it takes a long time, much longer than it does here. And what happens is, is that the those super fines in, in this kind of situation get you know, there it's all part of the matrix of different different size coffee grounds in the coffee bed, so it doesn't quite clog the the filter in that way. So that's that you can so you can do the the French press, uh, but that is the that is the downside of the French press, or of trying to to what do you call it to uh, trying to filter it after you've pressed it. All right, so the cigar has gone out in the time that I've been talking. So let's relight. This time I'm going to use the torch. I'm doing the Cirillo method around the edges. Which works surprisingly well. But I'm going to tap that part out now that we're really. So Dice says damage claim on a vintage supercharger. So you're getting the supercharger for the the Triumph. Is that right? Triumph, the V8, and the supercharger on the V8. That seems reckless. Wonderfully reckless. Speaking of which cars, like I was driving the other day and I see this car, this blue car, and it's got this really radical like front end. And I was like, what is this car behind me? And it's several cars back. It had a very Ferrari-esque, um, McLaren-esque kind of front end. And I was like waiting and waiting. And so finally the guy came, was able to pass me. And it was the brand new Corvette. Wow, that looks great. That, that new Corvette looks fine. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, that, that's a Corvette. Like, the last generation Corvette with the three trumpets exhaust in the center, I thought that looked pretty badass. This one looks crazy badass. Mm, TR4, excellent, excellent. Oh, so here's the thing. On the relight, right? So far, the relight, that brightness that has been, you know, pronounced throughout the entire smoke has now diminished. It's not, it's not, it's still a little bit there, but not quite, not quite as harsh, right? Mid-engine TR4, nice, nice. Kind of like the 308 Ferraris. Still my favorite of the Ferraris. Hmm. Okay, so now we're getting better. Now we're getting a little more, a little more body. A little bit more of the cacao note is starting to come through. Oh, the new vet. Oh, the new vet is mid-engine. Really? We need to look that up. Let's see the vet. All right, look at this thing. All right. Corvette thing. You know those 70s stingrays and the 80s stingrays? Look at that thing. That just looks. Yeah, that's the one that I saw. It was blue, but with the target top. Man, rad. Look at that. That is pretty radical. Like, I want that. 
So convertible, so starting at 59.9, convertible has shown 91.25. I mean, look at that. Those, that, that front end is very Ferrari-esque, especially those like grills at the bottom of the lights. Oh. Like this is truly the first Corvette that I've seen that I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks killer, killer. All right, so a 59.9, what do you get for 59.9? All right, let's see, can we build in price? Yeah, 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 yeah. The coupe convertible, okay, so coupes, okay, so 59.9, but the coupe starts MSRP 69, 69.95, so, how is that possible, right? That is just ridiculous. Do I have to take away from the coupe? All right, so we would not consider the coupe. We would consider the convertible. In the trims, 6.2 liter V8 DI engine, eight speed dual clutch transmission, or the 2LT, 6.2 liter V8 DI engine, eight speed dual, well, what's the difference? Look at that, see it's going, each of these 1LT, 2LT, 3LT, they're all rising in price. They're just the same engine. Well, maybe it looks different. Let's see. Okay, that didn't change. That didn't change. All right, let's go back to this. Okay, next step, colors. Arctic white, torch red. Here's the Elkhart. No, that's not the one I saw. I think it was the rapid blue. Yeah, that's the one I saw. Rapid blue. All right, but that's too expensive. Well, we go back to torch red. Accent stripes. Let's see, what kind of stripes do they have? Midnight gray? What does it do? Is there stripes there? Oh, that's on top. Oh, it's on the, it's on top of the hood. Forget it. We don't want that. Interior color, jet black's performance textile. Does that take away? No, get that. We'll stay with the jet black Mulan leather. Yeah, Mulan, we like that Mulan leather. Packages. Z51 performance package for $6,000. Performance suspension, electronic limit slip differential, performance rear ratio, rear ratio, ratio rear axle, and Brembro anti-lock brakes. Roadside safety package, first aid kit. Oh, no, no, first aid kit. This is the kind of vehicle that you do, when you crash, you just kill yourself. Stingray R appearance package. Nah, I don't need that. Contoured liner protection package. All right, so maybe we go with the Z51 performance. Michelin pilot. Oh, remove the Michelin pilot. All season sports for 24535ZR19 fronts. And we're putting up Michelin pilot sport. So no more sport all season. We'll go to sport only. So for summer only driving, Brembo brakes. Okay, so we Brembo brakes. Okay, we'll do that. That brings us to seventy four five hundred. And then we got the wheels. I think the wheels that are on there, that kind of like spiderish Ferrari style wheel, that's pretty good. We could go black, carbon painted. No, I don't like that. How about this one? Nice, nice, not bad, not bad. Spectra gray, ooh, Spectra gray. Hmm. So the package includes this heavy duty cooling system. So I could put it together without the cooling system. Okay, okay, good. Exterior options, uh, painted wheels, no. Center cap, no. Wheel lock kit, no. You don't park that anywhere. You just drive and just show yourself around town and then drive home. Don't leave the car anywhere. We don't need to do that. Corvette script rear emblem, Arctic white. So I could do the Arctic white Corvette script on the blue or on the red. That would be kind of fat. Or look at that, indoor car cover. Coffee cigars can figure. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, look, Corvette Museum delivery. I guess that means that you pick it up at the Corvette Museum. 
National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Oh, I can go see, visit my friend Sophia and see her new coffee shop. Customer VIN ending reservation for $5,000. What does that mean? So reserve the VIN number for your Corvette and use it as the ultimate way to personalize your vehicle. This option is subject to restrictions, not available all VINs. I guess that means that you can like put your own name. The VIN number, oh no coffee. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh no, 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 we don't want that. Take that away. Take that away for $5,000, that's crazy. Look at that. That's pretty fat looking, look at that. What is that like thing on the side here, right? To the right of the, the big Corvette screen, is that like a shift selector or some kind of, can we zoom in? We can enlarge. Oh, a little function controls. Oh, we can get a look at that though. That's pretty, this here, this selector is kind of, uh, what is it? Lamborghini-esque. Maybe this is the parking brake. Oh, look, they have a little like third pedal here. I like that. Mm. I wonder why they built it so much around like this whole like, I guess if you crash, it's supposed to protect you more. All right, let's close that. GT1 bucket seats, competition sport bucket seats. What's the difference? Designed for increased support for track and high performance driving. Man, why would it not include that? They should already have that. Oh, look at that. You could change to the red torch seat belt. Remove the black seat belt color. You can't see it. What does that matter? Maybe we can see it here. Mm -hmm. Oh, performance data and video recorder. Oh, that would be kind of cool. Oh, and there's no price on that. So I guess that's X that. Oh, wow, 1795, forget it. First aid kit, accessories. Summary, 7638. Okay, let's see view inventory. Where do we have this? Oh, look at that, that's kind of, oh, 81. Uh, convertible RT, huh? No, 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 no quotes. 69,490, it's in transit. It's going to Jack Gardner, Jack Weingartner Chevy, Chevy, 60 miles away. The exact match, ooh. How's that exact match? I want it red. Oh, sold. Oh yeah, the red, there's the red, sold, yeah, whatever. But that's 300 miles away, forget it. 70,000, 75,000. I think we need to stay with the 69,000. 72, there's that blue. Oh, that blue's nice. Oh, the, the silver flare metallic's not bad looking. The black is stealthy, but I don't know about that. So Dice says, some guy had the recorder and got the service tech at the dealership doing what? <laughs> well, the service tech has to make sure that the car's performing an optimal performance, right? Hmm, 69, here we are, 69, 395 in Doral, in Florida. Ooh, fly down to Florida, play a run of golf at Doral, drive home. That'd be kind of fun drive, 1,000 mile drive. Get arrested in Georgia, never make it home. Ooh, look at this one, this kind of Elkhart Lake Blue Metallic, that looks kind of nice. In Manassas, that's close. Oh, but that's 94,000. No, 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 no. No, no, no. So here's the thing. So like I was talking to a friend of mine, no, my, actually my, my pest control guy, who does a great job. And so he was at the shop last month and he was telling me that his, his $45,000 Dodge Ram pickup truck, he can sell and trade in used for 51,000. So like, evidently the price of like resale values of vehicles is sky high at the moment. And I looked it up and my Tacoma could get like 28,000. So if I got 28,000 for the Tacoma, the new Tacoma kitted out is like 37. But 
30,000, let's say, let's, let's say 30, trade in 30 for 69.4. So it'd be, it'd be like $40,000. That would be interesting. So the cigar, back to the cigar. The cigar, while the body has increased a little bit, the, the brightness is still there. It's still a bright cigar. It's kind of that, it's more sprightly, like a sprite, like that kind of like lemon limey kind of character. And um, not bad. I, I'm, I'm guessing, I guess I'm getting used to it. And with the, the Chiapas coffee from Mexico, that's also very bright. It's, it is a nice combination between the two. It's very complimentary, you know. There's not, it's not terribly challenging. Neither, this, this is not a terribly challenging cigar. It's just a bright, a bright cigar. Hmm. Not bad, not bad, not bad. So far, not bad. But what else has been going on in the world? What did I... I've been watching something else. Oh, The Blacklist. So The Blacklist finally finished after 22 episodes. I'm very pleased that The Blacklist was the show that decided to give, like, the full season. Like, you know, most every other show that I, that I follow went 15, 16 episodes this year because of the pandemic. You know, so production started later in the year. So typically production, at least for network television production, usually starts in July. And then they usually run 21 to 23 episodes a season. Most of them finish at 15 or 16, maybe 17, I think. So you kind of got shortened season for most of the, the network shows. But NBC and, and The Blacklist went for 22 episodes. So it was really nice to, to have that full run because last year they kind of, they had to end it early, of course. So they kind of had to wrap up last season's stuff in the, in the beginning of this season. And then they went for the full. And I, I'm, I'm, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Unfortunately, like, um, you know, spoilers here. They did kill Elizabeth Keene in the show. Which I was pretty surprised. I didn't know that she was leaving, that Megan Boone was leaving the show. So now it's just Red Reddington, all by himself. Hmm. So I wonder, it makes me wonder what's the next season going to look like. But I guess it's not too bad because they did kind of set it up. They, Megan Boone's character was missing for eight episodes of this year. So they kind of set it up without her. But she, her character did play a role behind the scenes in a lot of those episodes. So... But I, I, this show can, I guess the show can stand up without her. I mean, really, the show really is James Spader. So as long as Spader's there, she'd do well. And then Dice talking about Rick and Morty season five. Nice, nice. I, you know, that's another one I haven't really watched. Rick and Morty, I don't know much about it. You know, Bud and the guys watch a lot more shows than I do. Oh, on Adult Swim. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, animation. Okay. So season five is now starting. Is that correct? Because it says here that it only had four seasons. So my friends are talking about the new Doctor Who. They keep waiting for Doctor Who. I've been waiting for Doctor Who. I'm also waiting for um, the Orville, but Orville probably won't come back till 2022. I don't know if Doctor Who will come back until 2022. So I don't know. I don't know these things. I did make some uh, chicken for dinner today. Oh, and the guy says, also, oh, George says, hey, George, how's it going? Man? Good to see you. Also, be sure to check out season seven of Bosch. Bosch, I'm not, I'm not even, again, another show I'm not terribly familiar with. 
I just think of Bosch as a as that German uh, company. Bosch, an American police procedural streaming television from Amazon Studios. Let's see here. Titus Welliver as Los Angeles Police Detective Harry Bosch. Oh, nice. Okay. Oh, I'll check that out. Amazon, that should be easy to find. Yeah, now that the uh, now that most of my shows are over, I'm kind of looking for that. Stars Ted as well over. Correct that ASPP great show. Okay, excellent, excellent. And then Dice says Rick and Morty season five start a few weeks back. So, so what are you smoking tonight, George? Anything interesting? And when are we gonna get together for that uh, that smoking session we talked about? I'm not familiar with Titus Well, Titus, Titus, not Titus, Titus. Titus Welliver, let's see what he has to say about him. Oh, yeah, 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 there he is. Okay, I know this guy. I'm familiar with him. I just didn't know him by name. Oh, Transformers. Oh, he was cast in Director. Oh, yeah, he was in there. Oh, he's in Argo, yeah, yeah, Argo. Assault on Precinct 13, Twisted. Hmm. Twisted. Oh, Deadwood, that... Didn't they do a new... Oh, he was in Deadwood, right, right, right. He was Silas Adams, that's right, that's right. And smoking the Tato Escasos, the Escasos and or just the regular Escasos? I got the, the, the last time I saw Pete when he came to, to Raul's, I got the Escasos and those were nice. This is the uh, Hoya de Nicaragua silver toro it's a very bright to me to my palate it's a very bright citric kind of acidic kind of cigar like we were talking earlier like i was looking at some of the reviews that that uh, brooks whittington had written and, and and or like will cooper had and they had a lot of their flavor notes were very different than what i'm tasting Any thoughts on that? Like for George, you might maybe you might know more on this one. So like, you know, I'll go back to it. Like Brooks was talking about in his in his tasting, he had like dark chocolate, creamy almonds, creamy oak, cinnamon, leather, espresso, floral. I mean, I can see some floral notes, maybe some of the cinnamon, but definitely it's a stronger acidic, citrusy kind of experience. And, um, but mine is quite different. And George says, if you ever got the chance to see it, find Titus doing his impression of David. Oh, all right. I'll look that up on YouTube. I'm sure it's there. And the Escasos from SNS. Did they have an Escasos in the SNS? Is that one of the ones, one of the five in the... I just renewed my uh, my membership for this year, so it should be. I always enjoy, I do I do enjoy those cigars from uh, from Tatuaje. I've been kind of holding on to some of like some of the boxes that some of the years I've smoked them all like they're all gone, but the, over the last maybe in the last four four or five years, I smoked that I smoked the the ten. And then left the last five set, the last set of five. So I first smoked the two first sets, and then left the last set just sitting. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm doing that. Haven't smoked the JVN silver. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not. It's just different than what I'm. What I'm used to and what I tend to, what I feel like I tend to gravitate towards. Like, this has very bright acidic citrusy notes, and I don't know if I'm really. I don't know if I'm really into that. Mm, I agree. I agree. But it's always one of those questions, like you save it and you save it and you save it. Then suddenly you don't want to smoke it. <laughs> so you may have all these cigars. Like, oh, I, I shouldn't be smoking those. Those are from 2014. I need to keep them. 
I need to let them age. At what point do we stop aging and start smoking? You know what I've noticed in some of the cigars, so I've got cigars, like I've, I've had this sickness of the cigar where like, I would buy box, a box of cigars and then like keep it. Like I have boxes from the 90s of like Arturo Fuente, Arturo Fuente like um, double Chateau Fuentes, Chateau Fuentes. Uh, some of the, what is it, the, I want to say Selection Provada, but not that one, but a variety of the green ones and some of the Don Carlos line as well. And I always wondered, like, like, like you, you think that you save cigars, you age them because you, they're going to get better, you're going to get better. And then what I've experienced over the years of, of trying them every, like, every, like, let's say five years. Like, I remember one of the, the Fuente boxes, I, I, sm I saved it, saved it, saved it for a long time, smoked one, and it was kind of very diminished. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't very good, and I was like, oh, man, I totally, like, have gone beyond the point where I, I, and now I'm having diminishment, right? So, so I was kind of bummed out about that, and so I didn't touch it. I didn't touch that box again for like another like five years, let's say. And then I went and tried it again, and actually it, it seemed like that it had improved. So I wonder, like, do cigars go through this like a period of where it goes get better and then becomes fallow, and then becomes better and then fallow? I don't know if you've you've had that, but. Um, I never stop aging. Yeah, you know, th that's the thing. It's like, and that's where the sickness really is, is that like, so I took these boxes, right? Let's say in 1994. And I put them aside and I kept them with the idea that you're going to smoke them because they've aged and they've improved. The problem is, is that you do have to buy successive years. And I didn't do that for, I, I, well, I had never really done that. So I have these boxes that are like years, like decades now old. And I have nothing, so if, I, if they're really awesome and I smoke them all, well, I've got nothing, I've got nothing else, it's all gone. So it's very, 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 very strange. And certain blends are not designed for last, oh, yeah, well, got it, got it. <coughs> so you're describing that rest out cigars are during dumb period. So there is, so there is a period where they become dumb and they come, and they get better and then they become, do they become dumb again? And, is, that, is there like a sine wave effect to them? And then, so asking about the silver, how does it compare to other releases? So I've had the, the red several times, and I've had a lot of the uh, uh, Antonios. And those are all, I think the Antonio and the reds are a little bit more in my, in my range of like, what I like. Actually, it's been a long time since I've had a red, so I haven't had a red since I was last in Nicaragua. Because a friend of mine has a, well, a friend of mine owns a place called Selección Nicaragu Ni Nicaragüense, which is a, a local coffee shop. So they have an outlet in Matagalpa where they're based. They have two outlets in Matagalpa and one at the mall in Esteli. And so he, he sells cigars from the Cuencas, from, from Hoya at his cigar shops, uh, at his coffee shops. So I've had a lot of the reds with, with my friend there. Um, but normally I have a lot, of, I've, I've smoked quite a few of the Antonio. I smoked an Antonio just a couple weeks ago and really, really good. Like this, this doesn't, the silver doesn't have that kind of fullness of, of body and the fullness, the full richness of like the tobacco of the Antonio. Like Antonio is more forceful of a cigar, a bolder cigar. This is, bright and uh, it's just bright like really bright acidic cigar mm -hmm. yeah so probably I should be smoking a lot of those now but it's also one of those things where like I wonder oh in country they do the, oh you know that's a good point like I, I remember I was on a trip. I was on a coffee trip one year. We were in Nicaragua because I was buying coffee. I, I buy coffee in Nicaragua mostly from Matagalpa. And um, I remember I was in Nicaragua and I was heading to Salvador to join some friends to, to look at some of the farms there. And so it, it, you know this, and, but maybe the other guys don't, but at the airport in Nicaragua, at the departure lounge, past security, they have, um, Padron has that booth, right? 
And so I was kind of running. I had run out of cigars. I was like, oh, I need some cigars for the rest of my trip. And so I stopped by the, the, the Padron booth, and I just bought a five-pack of the Padron 3000s, right, the Maduros. And I took them back to, to um, I took them with me onward to Salvador. And I'm sitting at the farm smoking these cigars, and man, if these, these were the very best Padron 1000 series that I've ever had before or since, like they've never been this good, like the quality, the, the freshness, the hydration of the cigars was just perfection. And it was really, so yeah, yeah, when you say that the, in country they taste different, I, I, I can see that. Like it's, it was a really different experience that time. And so you're asking, do you find the same thing when tasting cupping coffee? As far as, as far as what, like the difference between, or whether they're bright? Like for example, the coffee that I'm drinking, which is a, from a company called Barista Champ in Me Mexico City, this is the Fincaceto Brujo from uh, Ocozo, Ocozo Cautla, Chiapas. And this one is a very bright coffee. So it's, a, it's actually a, a coffee that, that actually pairs very well with this cigar. So the, this is a bright, a bright light bodied coffee that, that really goes well with this, this light bright cigar. Mm, hydration, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, because interestingly enough, so I, I had the five pack, and I, you know, typically when I'm when I'm on a trip like that, um, the guys that I normally go coffee buying with, they're not really cigar people either, so it's really just me smoking, so I don't smoke heavily on those trips, especially like after we leave, we leave Nicaragua. So like I only smoked me, so out of that five pack, maybe I smoked three of them during the rest of the trip, and so I kept them, and you know, when I came back to the U.S., and it, you know, several weeks or maybe a few weeks had gone by by the time I got to the other two, and you know, by that point the hydration had changed, and the, the cigars were not as good as they were then. So that makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, Tony, what's going on, man? How you doing? Good to see you. So the cigars it's starting to go out again. So Tony, we're smoking the. Uh, the Hoya Silver Toro, which is a six by fifty-two, so thinner, a thinner Toro than the last last week's Superfly by Oscar. Like the Superfly by Oscar was just like thick, right? Thick. Fifty-six. I think it was a fifty-six. This is a fifty-two, and that's something you guys might know better from me. Like you know, the Toro. See, like most of the Toros that I smoke, ten I think are fifty-fours, right? And so these. The 56 seem rather large, ring gauge, and the 52 seems smallish on the side. So, is the tor is there is there more of a a standard for ring gauge for toros, or is it more just the length? So I'm gonna have to relight this. So, so far the cigar has been bright, citric, acidic. Lower on the body. So it's, it's, uh, this is one of those times, one of those things where I've always been kind of torn in that the quality of construction is very good. It's, it's smoked consistently. The draw has been very consistent. The wrapper was really nicely done. Everything about it was really good. But it's just a bright, acidic cigar. That's the flavor experience. So I'm not really... I don't think that's really to my wheelhouse. And Inting's here. What's going on, Inting? How's everything going? Are you guys out there smoking? How's the weather up there in New Jersey? Is it, is it as hot and humid as it is here in Baltimore? Because it's pretty darn hot and humid. And so George says, traditionally a tour is a 50 ring gauge, but now, <laughs> 50, really, 50. And that's the thing that reminds, 
You know, 50 now seems thin, especially if this is really 52. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I remember back in the 90s that Churchill's were like, what, 7 by 48. And, you know, smoking these cigars now, it makes me wonder, like, is 40, 48? That seems like it'd be pretty thin. <coughs> so burn is a little bit funky, but it's, I think that's more right now because it's, it's kind of, it's gone out twice, but the first time it went out is because I was in the midst of putting together a Corvette order. I was, I was actually putting together my lower priced Corvette, the Z51 Corvette. And I was able to get it right under $70,000. But I didn't, I didn't place the order. I just kind of wanted to see, right? And George says, or oh, Tony says he agrees with George. That's, I guess that's as far as the Toro ring gauge. He also said that the, uh, he had the Corona Grande. I would agree with him. Yeah, the bright, and that's the thing, like, the article from uh, Half Wheel from uh, 2020, when they did a redux with Brooks, uh, Brooks had notes of uh, dark chocolate, creamy almonds, creamy oak, cinnamon, leather, espresso, and I don't really get any of that. Like, this has just been bright, acidic, citrusy. That was, yeah, and that's what I thought, the, the 7x48, I thought that was classic. And then George says, so these are traditional. The Coronas were 55 by 42. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, Robustos 5 by 50. Yeah, because I remember the Robustos used to be more like, I remember the Robustos being more like the size of the, of the current uh, Illusioni Rothschilds, rather than like, like now these, these, these other ones are like, seem, Robustos seems rather massive. Taurus was 650. Churchill was always 7 by 40. Okay, yeah, see, that's okay. And then Tony says the Cuban Rothschild was about 4 3 quarters by 48. Okay, good, good. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I was wondering. Like, because even Coop, William Cooper had the same kind of similar flavorful profile that Brooks had. And that's kind of the thing. It's like, of course, we're now 2021. The cigar first came out in 2018, and Brooks or Half Wheel did a review in 2018. Let's see. Uh, so this is Half Wheel's 2018 review. Is that right? It kind of looks the same. Yeah, 20 October 2018. Also Brooks, and he you know noted um, creamy cashew and oak leather, dark chocolate, espresso, hay, and bread. Whereas in his 2020 interview, you know, creamy oak, dark chocolate, creamy almond, cinnamon, leather. So the bread, so it makes you wonder like, you know, is, is it a question of consistency when, when this happens? Like, you know, we're talking over three years, you know, the cigar, is the blend really, is the, is the blend truly changing? Like, are they? If the blend changes, is that, I mean, a blend changes, so you're gonna have, if it has different flavor notes, then, you know, is that is that a problem, I guess, is the question. And the Robusto was the updated version of Rothschild, which is typically 475, okay, okay, gotcha. But yeah, so that little bit of a burn difference we saw just a few moments ago has kind of evened itself out as we're getting right to the end of the cigar. It's not getting overly hot or anything. Actually, the, the coolness of the cigar has remained consistent throughout. There was some heat at the very beginning. And flavor drips, yeah, that makes sense. That makes, I mean, that's... And that's actually something that we see even in coffee. Like, we could have the coffee from the same farm, even down to the point where it's at the same um, same plot from the farm. Like, 
the coffees from two different years can be quite different. Actually, it's really interesting because, like, you know, there was, I remember one point several years ago, maybe this is like 2010, I was in Uganda, and one of my friends, Andy, he runs a company called Great Lakes Coffee in Kampala. And basically his company, what he does is that he works with, he's an exporter, so he works with a lot of farms and farmers and, you know, kind of collects coffees and then processes them and then prepares them for export and then sells them to a lot of the importers in other countries. And he does very well at it. And it's a, in, in their case, they're a multi-generational exporter, so his family's been in the business for a couple generations. But he was, um, I remember, you know, I had, by this point in my, in my career, I had I'd finally gotten gra a, a real solid grasp on like crop years and like the difference between crop years and like production, and I thought I had a really good handle on it. And so I'm, I'm hanging out at their, at their offices and doing cuppings with them. And then he started, we were cupping at the time, what we called day lots, right? So the same farm, the same plot, but different pickings from different days, right? So let's say in our, in our world of especially coffee, you have a tree, right? There's a big tree of coffee. In commercial production, basically they'll go through and they'll strip the trees. They'll, they'll find this point where most of the coffee is fully ripe. And then they'll pretty much, in one fell swoop, they'll strip the tree. And so in coffee, the, the coffee cherries go through different phases. So, of course, green is very ripe. Then it becomes yellow, then orange, then red, then crimson, and then rots, right? So they'll wait till most of them are in the red crimson range, and then they'll strip the trees down. Well, in specialty, we only want the ripest cherries. So... The pickers go to the trees and they pull only the red and crimson cherries off the trees. But because it's selective harvesting, they'll have to go multiple passes on that tree throughout the harvest season to get all of the cherries at the ripe at the ripest, right? So you're going through the you're going to each tree on average seven times. And I remember that uh we were cupping what they call day lots. And the day lots are basically the stuff from that, from each individual plot. They were all separated. So you separate all by, by the plots and you separate by days. So we were cupping the day lots. Same plot, same coffee, different days. And the difference between them was quite, at times, very, very apparent. And it was at, it was at a point where I was just feeling like I had a, gra a good grip on what was going on and how to understand harvesting and like how to understand, you know, selection. And then he was like, well, here's the day lots. <coughs> and I remember I was just like, oh my God, man, now I have to, now I have to deal with day lots and understanding day lots. And so what you do is that you take these day lots, right? And you're cupping these day lots and you're evaluating the day lots. And then you're, in, in their case, you would take those day lots, find the ones that are very similar and then combine them into a, a one, one offering, right? And, but I had always just kind of had the conception that it was just, this one plot is gonna have one style and you're just gonna offer that. But really it wasn't. You would actually take different plots, different day lots and then put them together. And I was just like, oh my God, man, I can't. At that moment, I was like, oh, just when I was starting to get it, I'm losing my mind again. So, yeah, so there's some similarities as far as flavor drift from year to year. Uh, we try to, like with one of our coffees, the, one of the ones that I, we try to do every year that's relatively consistent is um, our Perla Negra from Nicaragua. And that's, that's one that we're trying to find a particular flavor profile. So, yeah, it, it's definitely interesting, I think. Just when you think, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like, man. Just when you think you got it, you got it down. You get schooled again, which is something that I really enjoyed with, like my mentor in the business, a guy named John Sanders. Like, like I, I, there's always times when you know when you're when you, I guess when you when you hook your wagon to a certain group of people, you always kind of you do kind of wonder, right? Like, you know, legitimacy. Like, but I remember one day he was, we were we we hadn't seen each other in a while, and I ran into him. We were talking, and he was like. He was like, yeah, man, I was just at this, I was just taking this, he was telling me he was just taking this course in coffee, and he was like, yeah, man, I totally got schooled. 
And I'm like, man, dude, you have, you have like decades more experience than I do, and you're still getting schooled. I was like, and you're still open to being schooled. I was like, yeah, this is why I'm, I'm, I want to be part of that. that. So I'm always interested to, to learn more and, and, and like, and be challenged in that respect. I think that's an important way to learn whatever craft and industry you may be in. All right, my cigar's gone out again. So now I'm getting to the very end because I'm talking too much. That's really what it is. So going with the Cirillo Relay. What do you think about this, George? Like, you know, normally in, in the past, I would like press out the cherry and then relight down the, the cave. And then, you know, when you relight that way, of course, burning embers are flying everywhere. You know, putting holes in your clothes and burning your wood tables. But then Cirillo, when he was on the show in October, he's like, yeah, you, I light it this way by going around the edge. And I found that to be quite, quite good as a relight. So John plied his trade in uh, Seattle. He had a place, when I first met him in 2003, he was running a, a shop called Heinz Public Market Coffee in the East Lake neighborhood of Seattle. But by 2005, he had, um, <coughs> the lease in his building was up and um, they were gonna tear down the block and they had to close. So he moved up to, uh, he took over another place called or Origins Organic Coffee in uh, Vancouver on Grenville Island, Grand Vancouver. So he's based out of there now. But he just sent me a message. He was in Dubai today, and I was like, what are you doing in Dubai? I don't know. He's, he's all over the place sometimes. Put it. <laughs> but, you know, actually, it's, it's not. Sometimes when you get to this point in the cigar, right, it, it, it's not very good. It's actually still, it's still pleasant. Like, even though it's not really in my wheelhouse of flavors, it's still a pleasant smoke. And also, maybe I'm cheap, you know. Something like that. Oh, do you really? Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah, John, is, I have been uh, friends, and he's been my mentor since 2003. Actually, it was really interesting because I met him because I was in, I decided after, so I had started in coffee in 2002, and we were just doing brewed coffee, and I, because I was from Hawaii, or I lived in Hawaii, I, I was focused really on coffees from Hawaii. And so I had, actually I started out because I was like, trying to figure out what to do with coffee, because I decided we were gonna do coffee. But really I knew nothing, I knew nothing about the business, I knew nothing about coffee, because I really never drank coffee before, like I wasn't really, my father, I grew up drinking, uh, my father would grow up, when I was growing up, my father was drinking Taster's Choice. And I never, I always thought that was bitter and just nasty and like, I never really liked it, like, like coffee very much. And then um, when I started drinking some coffee, it was because I was going like, Tony knows this place, there's a, and you know this guy, Jim Gilpatrick. When I moved back to Baltimore in 1996, I started going to the Rolling Road Tobacco Warehouse that was owned by Jim Gilpatrick, and, and Jim used to have these coffees in the front, and he would do like this hazelnut coffee and, and stuff like that, and you know, he would offer us coffee to drink you know, some from time to time with the cigars, so I was like, well, it's, it's cheap and it's free, so I'll, I'll go with that. And so I would use, I would get the 16 ounce coffee, and I would use six sugars and a lot of cream, and so I would drink that with my cigar. And um, so finally I decided that I was going to get into the business just for, from other paths happened in 2002. And I started doing uh, coffee from Hawaii and, and I didn't know anything about it. So I, all I could think was, well, there, I, I need coffee. I need fr coffee from Hawaii. And I know there's farmers in Kona. So I reached out to a few farmers out there and I flew out to, Hon to Kona. And I met, with some, I met with one of them and I decided that we're going to start buying from... from uh, from this place called uh, Pelly Plantations. This, this guy, Gus Broxen, really great guy. And, um, but we were just doing brewed coffee at then. And so a year later in 2003, I decided we needed to get more into espresso because that was the trend. And I decided that I needed to, to learn more. So I, 
I decided to go to this trade show in September 2003 called NASCOR, which was the North American Specialty Coffee Retailers. And it's no longer a functioning organization or trade show, but there they had an espresso class. So I signed up for this like three day espresso class. And I sat down and next to this guy who for some reason wanted to be friendly with me. I was like, and he, and you know what, that's the first thing he said, hey, let's go, ahead, let's go try coffee. And I was like, um, okay, like really, I wasn't looking to make friends with anyone. I just wanted to learn and just kind of go back to my hotel and hang out. But he was like, let's go try some coffee. So we went over to a place called Stumptown. And uh, Stumptown had this coffee from Ethiopia, the Harar. And it had, at that particular crop, had this beautiful blueberry character to it, like a really apparent blueberry, like blueberry flavor that, it, it was still black coffee, no cream and no sugar, and it was this super forward, fruity flavor. And I was so amazed by that. But anyway, so as, we're, as I become friends with this guy over the weekend, his name is Dez, Dez Rock. And he turns out that he's the guy that, so Kinko's was, owned by that guy, that red-haired guy that started Kinko's. And, and he, evidently he had just started Kinko's, but it was this guy, Dez, and he was, back then he was based in Dallas. He became part of the Kinko's franchisees, and it was Dez that actually created all the structure and everything that eventually grew Kinko's into what it became, and now the FedEx store. But he wanted to start his own like coffee roasting place on Whidbey Island in Washington State. And so as we're talking and he, we're becoming friends, he's like, hey, I want you to meet this guy that I'm taking roasting classes from. And it turned out to be John. And like, I was this guy that was completely green, knew nothing. And um, yeah, the nice thing was that John was very much like open to like sharing his knowledge and like you know, everything about it. And so he kind of, for some reason, he welcomed me, this guy from the East Coast who knew nothing and had nothing to offer. And he just kind of opened his door and shared with me all of his knowledge and everything about it. And so I've always been very grateful to that, you know. All right, so George says, I always say that the time of sign of a drill grid cigars that it sticks to your fingers, you go for the exact... <laughs> <coughs> And he, no, no, no Bustelo for me. No Bustelo. I never tried Bustelo until many years later. I think I was in, I think I did a trip to Miami one year, like in 2008, when I first tried Bustelo. And Jim, yes, yes, Jim was the ex-Faders man. He was, uh, what, he was Bill's right-hand guy for a long time. And, you know, and he, another, he's another great example. When I first came back to Baltimore, I decided to go to, I was looking for a cigar shop, and so I went to, and his shop was close to where I, where I live here in Baltimore, and I, I went down there, and I found, the, found to be a nice shop, nice, you know, the guys were pretty cool, and so I started going there on somewhat a regular basis, and I remember maybe about two weeks or so into my, my smoking there, and I really hadn't talked to the staff much. I mostly talked to the guys, right? I would go select a cigar from the humidor, sit down. Like, they would close at 6, so I would go usually at 3 o'clock so that I'd have enough time to sit down and, and hang out and, and chat. And I remember about two weeks into it, I was checking out. I was leaving. I was like, all right, guys, see you later. And they were like, have a good day, Jay. And I was like, and as I walked away, I was thinking, how did they know my name? I never told them who I was. But that was kind of an you know, indication that, you know, how Jim was as an operator. He was really, really good, really, really sharp, really, really welcoming. He got to know who, he knew who I was without me telling him. And I, I thought that was really, really, and so really, really significant. And I ended up, you know, being part of their scene for the entirety of time that he was in Lutherville until the very end of, of his time there. It's always interesting to find these, these really nice places to hang out. And Stumptown, North Carolina, no, actually Stumptown was based out of Portland, which is, and so Stumptown took their name, for, I guess Portland was known as Stumptown because I guess when they cleared out Portland, it was all forest. And so they cleared out everything to make, to build the town. And they just left all the stumps behind. 
And I think that's how the name Stumptown came from, to be part of like the, the Portland lore. And so the guy that, that started Stumptown, Dwayne Sorensen, who actually became a friend of mine as time went by, he started Stumptown like in 1999, I think it was. And then now they're owned by that, that, that conglomerate, JAB, in Germany. You know, he sold out and did very well for himself. All right, that cigar is, I guess, I guess we'll have to say the cigar is done. So, as Rusty likes to say, wants to know, would I buy it again? And so this is a cigar that's, it's interesting. Like, I've smoked it pretty much all the way down. It's had great, good construction, good draw, good burn. But it has a, a flavor profile that I don't know if I necessarily gravitate towards. You know, this bright, acidic, citrusy, kind of like Sprite on the tongue character. Um, so that's a good question. Would I buy it again? Maybe by the stick. By the stick, if, I, if it was available and maybe if I was in the mood but for me, I like more robust, fuller-bodied, complex cigars. Not necessarily fuller-bodied, because like two of my more favorite cigars, the uh, the Bellicosa Maduro from uh, PG and the uh, SP54 Siri Pravada 1975 Maduro from uh, Abe Flores, those are nice and complex, but they're not really heavy and, and you know full-bodied. But what about again? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, probably, you know, if I, if I was in the mood, I would definitely get it again. It, it, was, it was a nice, nicely done cigar overall. I am tempted to continue to smoke it. Then why not? What else are we going to do? Go home? Have a few more minutes at least. Let's try lighting again. See if we can get right down to the... So all of you guys, what do you guys, what are you, what are the rest of you guys smoke? I know that, that George has been doing the Escasos. How about you, George and Inting? What are you guys trying out tonight? That's true. That's very true. That's very true. Actually, I probably wouldn't turn down anyone giving me a cigar. Like I remember one time I was uh, when we when the IPCPR was in uh, was in uh, New Orleans. Was that 2016? I remember I was out with Raul one night. We were at some we were going to some party, and for some reason I had, didn't have a cigar. I had run out. I forgot or whatever it was. I was all by myself, and um, we ran into the rep for Gurkha. And he was a really great guy. And um, he was like, aren't you smoking anything? I said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. He was like, well, here, try this. And he gave me the one of their vintage cellar, number 12-year tw vintage, right? Cellar aged. And, uh, you know, it was... I have to be honest. It wasn't really to my taste, right? And I, But I did smoke the whole thing because, you know, I was... I'm very grateful that someone was willing to share with me a cigar, and I'm very happy for that. But look at that. Even right now, where it is here, it still has a nice, it still has got nice straw and nice smoke. So Tony's smoking the Monte Cristo Espada Series Guard, which is a 6x50. The Monte Cristo, I imagine that's, I'm presuming that's the Dominican version. Yeah, look at that. We're, so, we're really down to the very bitter end. So, Tony, are you back with the, uh, the Cherry Diet Pepsi? We're really, really going down now. 
of that. that it's, it's getting to the point where it's going to burn my fingers. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Placencia makes nice cigars. I really like their factory. They have a nice factory. Like that hacienda-looking factory with the fountain in the center. All right, now we're starting to get a little bit more of the burn. And Diet Cherry Pepsi has returned. Excellent, excellent. I'm not disappointed then. I've been drinking a little bit of the more of the Dr. Pepper, Diet Dr. Pepper lately. I, actually, I finished the six pack that I had, so I'm not really smoking, drinking that anymore. I've been making, um, you know what I've been making actually for lately is um, blackberry soda. So I, I made my own blackberry syrup, right, from fresh fruit. So basically you take the blackberries and you macerate them with sugar. And uh, this particular batch, I just kind of did it for a couple hours. So basically what you do is you take, you take the raw berries, the, the ripe berries, and um, you mix it with... Uh, sugar and then you let it macerate basically you let it kind of break down and and the, the juices come out so I, this this one I put a little bit of salt just to give it a little pop and then you kind of mash the berries and then you strain them right so you can kind of see it's and so you create this All right, I'm gonna put this down because now it's kind of burning my fingers and it's becoming difficult to, to draw on. And so you just kind of take that and, um, well, I'll show you. Take your glass. And you take some of this syrup. And you put a bit of it like that. I don't, I don't really, I don't really measure, like, measure, measure. I just kind of go by the eye. Then I'll take some seltzer water. Mix that in. And this nice thing is that you kind of adjust it to your taste. And then some ice cubes. As thus, and there it is, fresh soda. Well, that's nice. All right, good, good. So Tony says, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Oh, Rusty, good to see you, man. So Rusty's asking, have you invested a soda stream? You know what? Brian gave me a soda stream and I was looking into it and the the CO2 so so the soda stream uses this proprietary CO2 nozzle that only is from their product but there I did see something online where you can get an adapter nozzle so you can use the typical CO2 tanks that you can refill and we used to use them in paintball and um, these are seven ounce tanks, and so you fill them with liquid CO2, and that will allow you to adapt the soda stream to the regular tanks. I just haven't taken the time to buy it. Um, I should, I should, I should. Muzzle some, oh, that would be nice, that would be nice. Yeah, 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 with the Florida Kanye. Yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. Actually, the mint, so my, my, uh, who was it? One of my friends had some mint one year. Like maybe, this is like maybe 12, 15 years ago. And he's like, try planting it here. And so he planted in the corner of, the, of one of the, the flower beds. And over the years, it's just kind of spread. Like you don't want to plant mint because it just, it's invasive. Like it's all, like I've got mint coming out the butt. 
Actually, I've been meaning to make a mint syrup. I just have to harvest it. But yeah, you could do this kind of approach with pretty much any, um, any kind of fresh fruit. So I also do this with strawberry. Like I was making some strawberry syrup today for the shop. Yeah, I wonder, since you mentioned it, All right, so we've got our floor seven, which is almost out. We'll mix a little bit into that here. See how this tastes. Mentos, oh, mint best, yes, very true, very true. But I think if you left it in the pot and you left it outside by your, by your like grass, It'll jump, like it jumped from one flower bed like 10 feet across the grass to another flower bed. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy invasive like that. All right, so let's mix it up. Let's see. Oh, not bad, not bad at all, actually. Now I can't drive. Oh, that's refreshing, I like that. All right, that's good to remember. I'm going to do that. Actually, I found out about this thing called today, um, called the Hana. It's it's a type of. I'll show it to you. The uh, oh, there it is, Hana Magoli, and it's this. Uh, it's this type of Korean rice wine it's not made with koji like sake is made with it's made some other way I, I just learned about it today from 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 one of my regulars and um it's a it's a cloud as you can see it's a cloudy rice wine that is is uh, made in a small batch made in brooklyn and um i i asked my buddy to get me one because actually i was thinking that this when I when we were talking, when he was telling me about, it, I was thinking, you know, well, maybe this might be something that'd be interesting. I don't know why it just came to the thought of like, what if I mix that with espresso? What kind of drink with it? So I'm I'm waiting on seeing if I can, if I can get, if I can get get a bottle. And Dai's asking, have you tried Mentos in the Dai Doctor? <laughs> I'll have to try that. Might be a kind of explosive. Kind of like bamboo, I guess. But yeah, so that's what's on my mind. This Hana Makoli, I don't know. Maybe if I get it in a couple of weeks, we'll we'll get to see, give, give it a try here on the show. And meanwhile, I'm having this blackberry for de Cunha. This that's what I really like. If you go to when you're in Nicaragua, at least in my experience, you go to these restaurants or bars and you order like. I don't even know how you order this, but basically you order, you order like, you order the floor and they bring in the bottle. And, and it, the interesting, this one place that I do this is a place in Managua called um, Tasca Kiko. It's a uh, Spanish restaurant where they do paellas and, and, and like all kinds of different Spanish style food. It's really, really good. It's actually one of my favorite restaurants. There's pretty much no time that I go to Managua that I miss eating there because it's really, really that good. But you go there and you have your bottle service and they bring you the bottle. And actually what they do is that the bottle may not be completely full. It may be like here and I guess they mark it or whatever. They, they just know how much you, you have. And then they bring you a bucket of ice. They bring you a shot glass for measuring. They bring you a glass and then they bring you Cokes. And you just kind of sit there eating, drinking. It's really quite fantastic. I, I, I really do enjoy that about Nicaragua, the floor sevens. So, yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. All right, so I guess that's good for this week. That was the floor, I mean, the, that was the Hoya de Nicaragua Silver Toro, bright, acidic, citrusy, I'd say lightly bodied, but nice quality construction, nice draw, everything, a nice amount of, you know, smoke, really well done. 
Um, just maybe not necessarily to my particular flavor profile, but very enjoyable nonetheless. Um, thank you very much for spending another Thursday night with me here on the live stream. I really appreciate you doing that, and uh, do tell your friends, you know. <laughs> also, one thing that I was thinking, I'm starting to put together plans for, if anyone's interested, to do a coffee origin trip in March of 2022. And I just want to put that out there in case anyone's interested. We're, we're planning to do like maybe like a three-day trip to visit some of the farms that I work with and uh, give kind of an immersive experience for people to have, to learn more about coffees and how it's produced and where it comes from. So that's coming up for next year. But um, other than that, next week, what, what's next week? I should be looking. I should know this. I don't know why I don't know these things. Next week, we are going to have, it's down in the, in the show notes below. And you'll see that if you look at the show notes. I, I should know this, and I have to look it up myself. Because oh, so next week is the lunatic torch for July 18th, for July 8th, and um, yeah, I don't. And so July 8th, if some of my friends are heading off to the PCA show that next weekend, I don't think I'm going to go. Are you going there, George? And then the 15th of July, we're going to have the Trinidad Espiritu Fundador, which is the uh, the, the American release, not the, uh, the Cuban made. So that's what's coming up. So come and join us again, plan for next week, 8 p.m. every Thursday night here on the live stream. Thank you, George. Appreciate you spending time with us. Inting, Tony, Rusty, Di, thank you guys all very much for coming, tuning in tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show and uh, the music. And uh, see you next week.